Welcome everybody, good morning. So I want to introduce the first speaker. Pierre van Moorbecke will speak about critical phenomena in random tilings and hexagons. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's, uh, Pisa is a city full of gems, uh, I discovered. So, why do we study tilings? That's the first question. You know, rather than, than other things. Why do we study tilings? Because, yeah, I mean, look at the churches. I mean, it's full of tilings there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because they have a lot of complexity. And you get all kinds of phases. I mean, they have a solid phase, they have a liquid phase, and they have a gas phase. Okay? So that's really, there are a lot of other models with Brownian motion and so on, but they have much less degrees of freedom, much less uh, complexity. And uh, so in fact, that's what I want to illustrate uh, today. So this is uh, what I'm going to speak about today is uh, joint work with Mark Adler and Kurt Johansen who is at the Royal Institute of Technology at uh, uh, Stockholm. These are a few papers, I mean very recent papers. Um, so let me... So uh, these uh, tilings of geometric shapes, I mean they can be lozenge tilings, they can be uh, dohomeo tilings, I mean, they have, as I mentioned, they have, uh, they can have a solid phase, a liquid phase, or gas phase. Liquid phase, that means that the correlations between two molecules are decaying exponentially with distance. And a, g a gas phase, that means there's less connection, so that means the, the decay is exponential. It gets exponentially small very quickly. In fact, I will, the models that I will present today will be essentially solid, will contain solid and liquid. There are other models which I will touch upon at the end very briefly that also have a gas phase. I mean, there's very recent work um, of the last two, three years, and I will say something about it uh, later on at the end. So, the models that uh, that Mark uh, discussed yesterday, they are domino tilings of geometric figures, and you, d you have, no, it's a domino, you explain domino, you, have, you, you can have two horizontal dominoes with the black on the left or on the right, you have a vertical domino with the black on top or below. With Lozenge tilings, it's, uh, you have three, three possibilities. It can be tilted towards the right, can be straight and can be tilted towards the left. And I like to give them colors so that uh, you see on a picture uh, what really happens. I will also show you a number of uh, simulations. Let me begin very briefly, review, I mean, a few minutes, the donor tiling of Aztec diamonds. Uh, this is an Aztec diamond. You want to tile this with, uh, with dominoes and you like to see what happens. So this is an example. It's an example which is generated by compute. You ask a compute uh, to do that randomly, to put those dominoes on there. And what you notice, okay, what you notice uh, is that there is part of it, this is blue, I mean, this is frozen. It's a frozen region. This is a solid region of green. This is a solid region of, of yellow. This is a solid region of red. If you close your eyes very slightly, you see that there is a Roughly speaking, there's a circle, inscribed circle, and the stochastic, the liquid region, is inside there. Okay? Uh, the boundary between, of course, if you have more and more uh, squares, if they come smaller and smaller, it would really look like, uh, macroscopically, it would really look like a circle. Okay? And so this is the uh, liquid region, and so about this model, we know essentially everything. So, um, these, these are pictures that Mark also showed. I mean, you have, if the horizontal dominoes are as likely as the vertical ones, then you get this picture uh, with the 
circle here. If the horizontal ones are more likely than the vertical one, then you get an, an inscribed ellipse. Okay, and of course the four uh, frozen regions. Um, th this is this simulation uh, uh, were done by Sunil Shita, uh, who is now in uh, who has a position in uh, England now, and uh, this is a situation with. 100, there are 100 uh, squares on, uh, around here. And as I say, everything is known uh, indeed. You have inside, inside it's a Gaussian free field. One knows what that is. I mean, it's, it's a kind of two dimensional Brownian motion. Then we have on the boundary of that Arctic circle, we have the airy process. The airy process is a Markovian process which locally looks like uh, the tracy william distribution. The tracy william distribution is it's a distribution which involves not a Gaussian, but which involves a solution of the Penelope II equation, which behaves at infinity like the airy function. Okay. Um, so it is a distribution which is which is totally the, the asymptotics to the left. I mean, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. It's asymmetric, and also uh, the asymptotic is totally different from Gaussian. So it, it's a profoundly different uh, distribution. And then you have where where you touch the boundary, you have another kind of behavior. And that's why I say you see well, what's important is the critical points. You always have something interesting appearing at critical points and that's where you have the sort of universal phenomena because it, it when I say universal phenomena it appears in many other situations okay so um, so this model we know completely so therefore it is of some interest to try to manufacture other shapes which may lead to new kind of distributions and um, Markella already um, I alluded to this, I mean you take two you take two such Aztec diamonds and you slide them together, okay? You have them overlap. And that gives you the fine picture. Notice one interesting one little detail which is uh, important is that um, yes there's one little detail which is important is that this has a slight non convexity here. You see, it's different there. And that non-convexity is responsible for a very, diff for a very, very, very different geometry of uh, the uh, uh, tilings. Okay, so let me, in fact, the next slide. Uh, then you, you can take this picture, the same as before, and you can add you can add a few squares here on that side and that side. That would be a different model. And again, that leads to different kind of statistics. Okay. So, um, let me just show you uh, this, the, the, the model which I just discussed. If you, take, if you look at asymptotics, I mean, you let these things become very, very large, I mean, then you have, uh, and you assume that there's very small overlap. Here, there's a very small overlap between those two Aztec diamonds here. Then this leads to the discrete tech node process. It's a, I mean, why tech node, uh, as, you, I mean, as you know, I mean, tech node is it's a very simple thing. It's two, two circles touching. Two circles touching like this. Okay, that, that's a tech node. It's different from a cusp. I mean, a cusp is something like this. That's a different singularity. I, I will uh, mention this later on. So here you have uh, a tech node kind of situation where those two um, those two circles touch very very briefly here, and but you have a different statistics here. That's called a discrete tech node process. Now, if you push them together much more, okay, if you push them together much, much more, then you will get, you see here, these two uh, el ellipses, these two ellipses, and these two ellipses, they, they touch briefly here, and that's called the technical process. That is related to the airy function. It's somehow related to the, to the uh, 
Uh, I mean, Tracy William de Sivoort, but it's it's a sort of a combination of two um, uh, Tracy William distributions. And then I, d I don't have a simulation of that, but then you can imagine, and that has never been done, but that's a sort of, sort of interesting problem. You can even push them further together in such a way that you would get uh, the, f the following situation that you would get, uh, say, uh, um, yeah, let me. That you would have a foreign situation, and this would be a cusp. Okay, yeah. okay. If you would push them further, and that's where you would expect to have the the PSC process. Uh, the PSC process is again one of these universities that have been seen in many many different contexts: uh, Brown and Moore from random walks, etc., etc. Uh, but I don't want to go into that. I mean, that's uh, that's another story. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. But big as well. Here, to be precise, you leave this distance uh, remains finite. The, the whole the, the system becomes larger and larger. This this remains finite. In that situation, the distance also tends to infinity. Okay, scaled in a precise way uh, according to the size of the. And then the third situation, I don't know. I don't know exactly now what you do, but uh, there must be somewhere a, a PSC process also. Uh, but, but that's, I, I don't know, I'm just... Um, and there's only one type of scaling in the second one? On, no, no, the scalings are very different. The scalings are very different. I mean, here the, here the distance it remains finite here, although the diamond gets larger and larger. There the diamond gets larger and larger, but the, the overlap also gets large, but scaled in a very precise way. Okay. Only one way? Only one way, only one way. It's a very, very, very precise way. Okay. Uh, <coughs> now, let me, what I really want to talk about is uh, hexagon with, with, uh, with lozenges. Uh, okay, so you see, this is lozenge which is tilted to, to the right, this is a lozenge tilted to the left, and then you have uh, lozenges here which are sort of, st I mean, st straight up. Uh, where are they? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, so I, 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 I really give away, the, I give, I really give away, but so because if you close your eyes, don't fall asleep though, if you close your eyes, then, then, then you see in fact a, a circle here, and this is frozen. You have, you know, you have six regions of, uh, six frozen, six solid regions, this is the liquid phase inside, okay. Um, yeah, so let me, this is a very old problem. It goes back to the early 1900s. Okay. McMahon uh, was a man who grew up in a military family in Malta, an Englishman of course, um, and he was sent to uh, India for a number of years to complete his military service and, and served as a colonel in the army. But then he became quite ill and he, be, he went back to England and started being a mathematician and a very, a very brilliant ma mathematician. In fact, uh, this is, I mean, he wrote a book which is called Combinatorial Analysis in Cambridge University Pr uh, Press that was, of course, re reprinted. I think it's, uh, the original was from 1910, I believe, or 1911, okay. So, um, Now, what McBean did, he looked at the number of tilings of such a hexagon. But in general, even, you know, not just a hexagon, a regular hexagon, but, uh, you know, a hexagon with uh, lengths A, B, and C, say, okay? And he came up with this absolutely uh, fantastic formula here. It's the product of these H's of A, B, and C, and A plus B, divided by H, A plus etc. Okay, where well, H of N is this number here. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, uh, in fact, another formula was discovered, but only recently. It was unknown to McMahon. It was, uh, I mean, for almost 100 years, it was not known. And it's this formula, which is due to McDonald. Okay, he came up with that formula. It's not totally trivial to, to collect those two. Okay. Um, so now we 
again, uh, just statistical questions, what happens for large sizes? Well, we have, so as I mentioned, as you saw visually, there's an Arctic circle which separates the frozen and the liquid region. Uh, there's in the liquid region, there's a Gaussian free field. There's an airy process along the Arctic circle. And then there's this Dewey minor process at the tangency points of the Arctic circle. Now, Dewey minor process, that is to say, you take a Hermitian matrix with a uh, with a Gaussian distribution, which are independent, okay? And uh, you look at the minors of that matrix. So you have uh, a one by one minor, with the, the eigenvalue will be uh, one number, two by two minor, two numbers, etc., etc. And we know very well they are interlacing, okay? They are interlacing. And in fact, you can describe <coughs> the statistics of those stylings along that point of tangency, that point of osculation, exactly in terms of these eigenvalues of the minus of that GUE matrix, okay? So that's an, uh, an amazing connection. Again, you have universality coming up. So now, uh, there has been, uh, th there's a whole canon of work on this topic, I mean, going back to, uh, of course, to, to McMahon, of course, and then it has been tackled by lots of people, <coughs> I would say mostly macroscopic questions, but also since maybe uh, for the last 10 years also microscopic questions. And this is, th these are just sort of uh, examples. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly non-exhaustive. Non I mean, there have been uh, many, many other works. In fact, Mattia Cafasso with uh, Bertola and so on. Mattia Cafasso collaborated with us on that subject, etc., etc. So there's, there's lots of things. And it is, it is uh, of course, it's mathematics, but it, it's things that can also be seen, that has been measured. And so I wanted to, to uh, mention a paper by uh, two Japanese, Takeuchi and Sano. They, they did uh, a, a bit of work on that, 2016, as the following uh, paper. I mean, they look at they they look at so-called nematic liquid crystal. Nematic means that the molecules are all oriented in the same direction. Nematic, and uh, they. I mean, that's somehow. I mean, begin of the crystal, and this crystal is being excited by uh, laser pulses. And the crystals start uh, growing uh, and, in fact, produce this kind of thing here. And what they have done is to measure the statistics of these fluctuations very, 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 very precisely, okay, of the transversal fluctuation of these things. And what they have found, and it's, it's an amazing piece of work, what they have found it exactly corresponds to the uh, Tracy Williams distribution. Okay. It's not, not Gaussian. So the Tracy Williams distribution is not some mathematical abstract invention, but it, it's there in nature. Okay? And I think there are many other models which could be studied. I mean, uh, coffee yeah. States. Sorry? Growing coffee stains. Yes. Growing, growing coffee stains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So anyway, this is, uh, in fact, there's a whole set of papers by those two gentlemen, Takeuchi and uh, Sano. Yeah, so as I already mentioned, we want to tile this with uh, three different types of lozenges. I, I give them a color, it's easier to think about blue, red, and green. And I think the next slide, uh, yes. So as I said, for the hexagon, everything is known. That, that's, that, that's dead. I mean. So, um, but you saw in the case of the domino tiling of the Aztec diamonds, one could create slight non-convexities, which really change the whole picture. And, and here, uh, let me do the following. Okay, I have a hexagon here. Okay, so hexagon. And I take scissors and I cut out this thing here. Okay, and I cut out something uh, up there. And then I tile this with those, uh, with those three types of tiles, uh, blue, red, and, and, uh, and uh, green. <coughs> and what we are interested in is to find out what the fluctuations are asymptotically, 
I, of course, I have to explain later what it means asymptotically. I, uh, you have to find out what the fluctuations are about in the region between those two cuts. Okay, there must be a special role. Okay, between those, the, those the two cuts. Antoine Duran is a student uh, of Tom Kleis in Louvain, and he has an amazing he has an amazing program which enables him to simulate all those. All those, uh, um, I mean, all, all, all those stylings. In fact, uh, the next slide I will show you such. A, uh, it's in fact very, very useful. You learn a lot from it. So, uh, yes. Okay, this is a tiling that Antoine did here for. This is length 50, length 30, 20. 60, I mean, these are all the lengths, 60 and, and uh, 30. You have the two cuts here, which I showed you, the two cuts here. Okay, and this is a, uh, a, um, a simulation. Um, you ask a computer, uh, computer to do that. You have, ag again, those frozen regions here, red, blue, green, etc., etc. But the presence of those two cuts now, it is responsible for some new kind of uh, phenomenon in between. By the way, these are all, these are all little uh, green tiles, because you, see, you don't see them because it's too small. They are little green tiles, but you get these paths. You get two elliptical regions here, which are connected with those paths here. Okay. And if you count, there are exactly ten such paths. Okay. And if you were to draw, if you were to draw a line, um, yeah, maybe I should mention that there's a special region here which I, I want to focus on. I take the, the line which extends that side of the upper cut and the line extending that side of the lower cut. So that's, a, I call that the strip. Okay, that will be the strip. And so in that strip you have those paths and as I mentioned they are exactly uh, 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 exactly, uh, yeah, ten of them, which happens to be the length of this minus the size of the cut. I mean, thirty minus twenty is ten. Okay, that that's uh, that's a theorem. So, yeah. it, it's combinatorics. Yes. There are two other lines going the other way. Yeah, yeah, there are two so other lines. Yes, absolutely, Ab absolutely. You can you can do the same thing. But uh, you can do exactly the same thing. You have to, in fact, it will come up later. You, you have two other lines going up like that. And you can do, you can do analysis. That's right, it's exactly analogous. But of course, here, here you are interested in, in the blue and the red tiles because, well, this is all green. I mean, there's nothing much to say. It's, it's, uh, when the size goes to infinity, then you get an infinite number of green ones. But with the proper scaling, we'll see that the number of such paths remains finite. Okay. Uh, when, uh, and what we, what we, uh, well, let me immediately say what we are really interested in. We are really is interested in the statistics. I, suppose you draw a line here. You would count the number of blue tiles along that line. They would be exactly equal to ten. I mean that's that's uh, understandable since you have ten such paths. But you you like to know what the statistics of that along that line when everything blows up, when the whole picture blows up, okay? So that's when uh, I say the oblique lines, I will always refer to them, and as you pointed out, it's indeed so that uh, you can do the same analysis in the other direction, but it would be the same story. There you would uh, pick up the, the red tiles, so. So this is another simulation. It's another simulation where the so, 105, 95, etc. And here you see very clearly the two, the two uh, ellipses and that region here, that strip again, that, that, that strip again here. And in fact, in the next slide, and that's interesting, I will zoom about that strip. So, I mean, I just took that picture and blew it up. And then you find the following. Okay, you find the following. So this is my strip here. This is this is a strip here. Yes, formed by uh, these cuts here. And then I draw parallel lines. I, I draw. I mean, it's ten here. Ten par parallel lines. 
uh, yeah, it's 10, it's 10 parallel lines and I count the number of blue uh, tiles which each of those lines intersects. And you see that number is always equal. So that means the number of blue tiles along each of those lines is always an equal number. An equal number, you, you can say what it is. It's this B minus D, which is, uh, which I think, uh, I think it was, well, uh, it was uh, uh, in this case, that the width of the strip is 10, it's 5 here. So if you, if you would count, uh, if you would count, you would, you would see that oh, it's 1, 2, yeah, it's five. Uh, anyway, it's five. Yes. And I guess next to next beyond the strip. Yeah, and then beyond the strip. Yeah, I mean that's um, good. Good point. Beyond the strip. I mean it's five always along those lines. And beyond the strip, if I go one step to the right, it becomes six and seven and eight and nine, etc. Okay, it, it, it increases. But unfortunately, in the finite case, it goes up, and then it goes down again. So the combinatorics is kind of tricky. So it's hard to do any analysis on this problem. Okay. We certainly tried to do the analysis uh, from scratch on this problem, but we did not succeed. But you can, you can get everything by some detour, which I want to explain. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is again, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, so there are three types of lozenges, I will make a little affine transformation to have you know, good coordinates. So the blue becomes this, the red becomes sort of slightly tilted, the green is uh, a, 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 a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit more tilted. So, and... Fellini Tyler pieces. Sorry? Fellini Tyler pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, you saw those cuts. Now, I just, there's a little trick there to deal with that. I'm going to cover those cuts with red tiles. They are, so to speak, the forbidden tiles. Okay. You, you cover them with red tiles a priori. Okay. So that means you don't have to worry about them. They are there, but, but all the rest has to fit with that. So that's a, that's a little trick. Uh, Yes, uh, but also, um, yeah, I already said that. So this is, uh, this is in fact, I would say, a, a, a working, uh, that, that so to speak, I mean, the workhorse of the, of the problem. I have, I have done this, this, this original shape, I slightly tilted it in such a way that I can put it on, on good coordinates, and you have here as as we always saw, they have the blue tiles here, you have the green one, the green one, etc. You have red ones. And the strip here, the strip here is formed by the, the, these two, uh, I mean, dotted lines here. That, that's the strip in question. Uh, in this case, the number of blue tiles along parallel lines on the strip is one, it turns out, in this case. Um, and now they are, as I mentioned, getting the, the kernel, getting the statistics for the blue tiles is, is difficult. So what we will do, we will go to the red tiles. And that's much easier, and I will explain why. Because um, this is frozen, okay? This, this is, uh, remember I said, you know, to deal with the cuts, you put red tiles and you don't touch them anymore. You have no freedom on that, okay? So you have, two dots here. Here you have a blue dot. I mean, it's easier instead of talking about tiles, I will talk about red tiles will be red dots and, and uh, blue tiles will be blue, blue dots. It's a little easier. So here you have two dots. Here you have, uh, you will have, I'm sorry, you have two red dots. Here you have three red dots. You have four red dots, etc. etc. It goes up linearly, all the way. And in fact, here I put red dots in some sort of artificial way, it doesn't matter, okay? So it's deterministic. Yeah, it's totally deterministic. I could have put, I could have put red here, red tiles here, but then the, the, the figure becomes uh, impossible to, to follow. So that's, that's totally, uh, yeah, that's right. Now, th this is a this situation that's much easier to study. So I will first study the process of red tile, the point process of red tile. So it begins with 
here with two, which is the size of the cut, then three, then four, then five, and they interlace nicely. Okay. Of course, that suggests uh, you know, certain things in combinatorics. Um, so this is the process of blue tiles. I just wanted to show you this is, this is the process of blue tiles. Uh, and I want, ultimately, I want, to, I want to know what happens with this. But uh, let me, therefore, immediately go to the red tiles here. Uh, I have, in fact, thrown away all the tiles and I just have red dots. And just, you have two red dots here, you have three red dots, four, five, six, seven, up to the end, okay? There's also one thing that I should have mentioned maybe early on, is that you have uh, non-intersecting paths, and therefore that's, I should maybe go back for one second to this picture. You can, you can decide to put uh, an oblique line starting from here on the green, the green tiles, uh, an oblique line, and on the blue tiles you put a vertical line. If you start here, you go up like this, and then you go up one step, you go flat again, and you go, and you end up exactly there. Okay. Then, if you start here, this is flat. You go up one step on the blue, you go like this, uh, and and there, and you keep doing that. I mean, that corresponds exactly. If you t if you look at the last one, um, you go up. I mean, here, you that's flat on the green. You go up here, and then you end up there. So there's, a, there's to the styling problem, that's another aspect. You have non-intersecting paths. They avoid exactly the red tiles. Okay. <coughs> so in fact, it's equivalent, these non-intersecting paths or these, this uh, tiling problem, that's an equivalent, uh, e e e equivalent uh, things. So, um, yes. So what we... What, what, what is the goal? The, the, the goal is to first obtain correlation kernel for the point process of red dots, and then to deduce a correlation kernel for the point process of blue dot, and then we will do asymptotics, let the size become very large. Um, <coughs> so let me say something, but I won't say much, but uh, let me say something about the combinatorics of this problem. It, it doesn't actually uh, the tilings of uh, the, the, I mean, the domino tilings, they relate more closely with orthogonal polynomials. Here it's a different story. It actually relates to combinatorics and to sure processes, uh, to, um, to, to uh, sure functions. So let me call the coordinates of these red dots at level m. m equal to zero is the bottom m equal to 1 is the next line, 2, etc. I, I give those coordinates here, and, uh, and in fact, I mentioned to you they are interlacing. Okay. So the m minus 1, the i's coordinate at the level m minus 1 sits between uh, those two at the next level, interlacing. Okay. Now, I, what I want to say, this, le this leads to a semi-standard skew young tableau. Okay. Um, Sorry, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I don't know. I'll show it to you. I mean, and let me. It's a trick which is really quite standard. I mean, it, you 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 take those coordinates and you add i to it, and you call that new i l. So let me take the, the that same picture here. Let, let me take that same picture here. Okay. Uh, you record the coordinates of these two points, or these three points, you always add plus something. This is plus one, plus two, plus three. And let me do the following. So, remember I had two points. I record the coordinates of these two points, and according to that little uh, thing, I find such a young diagram. Okay. I mean, I don't do I have to explain what the young diagram is. Is it okay? I mean, you find a young diagram. Now, next level up, level one. And by the way, this is frozen. That's why it's frozen. At level one, I record the coordinates of the red dots 
and I add always this plus one, plus two, plus three, etc. And I add it on to this, so I get this, okay? And I put one because it's level one. At level two, I do the same and I get level two. I keep doing this and then I find exactly that model. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, that model leads exactly to this picture here. You have numbers. So <coughs> this part here is frozen. Then you have, uh, this is weakly increasing. It can be one, one, and three, 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 etc. In that direction, it's strictly increasing in that direction. And that's called a, a skew young tableau. Why skew? Because of the fact that there's a, there's a little piece which is uh, excised, which is removed. Okay, that, that's, that's removed. You can't do anything about it. And also the final shape, you check that the final shape has to do with the geometry of your uh, hexagon, precisely. In fact, uh, to, be, to be precise, let me take that picture again. Okay, so uh, what it is in general, it would, it would be a semi-standard semi -standard that refers to the fact that it's weakly increasing left to right, strictly increasing from top to bottom. Um, Skew means that you excise this little piece here. This little piece has to do with the frozen, with uh, the uh, with the cut. Okay, um, this shape here. So you can exactly see the D is uh, well. The, the D was this, and the the, the C was that that length, etc., etc. So uh, the whole geometry of that problem is encoded into this. N N is the number of levels. Okay. And, and it's a number of levels. So that means you have a semi standard uh, skew young tableau w of which the shape is fixed and of which this, this, this part is fixed also. So now it's, a, it's an amusing exercise. Just fill it up with numbers from so 1 up to 10, from 1 up to capital N, N being a number of levels. Fill them up. There is a correspondence, one to one correspondence between those uh, semi-standard uh, skew young tableaus and uh, those uh, red dots. Okay. So, um, and also the correspondence with the non-insecting paths. So these elements will, be, will play an important role. And now we have, a, of course, we have a very beautiful piece of combinatorics. If you look at the skew young tableaus correspond, young tableau corresponding to lambda no, I'm sorry. If you look at the Shaw polynomial corresponding to the skewing uh, Young diagram lambda minus mu, that is given by that is given by uh, the following determinant, where the h's are. You take this function, expand them into z, and these are the h r. But I mean, that's just a well-known formula. Okay, it's a well-known formula. But this this uh, skewed Shaw polynomial has a remarkable property, okay? If I put, of course it depends on variables x1, x2, x3, etc. No, very far out. If I put 1, 1, 1, 1, n times, and then 0, then what do I find? Exactly the number of skew young tableaus, lambda minus mu, or in other terms, the number of red dot configurations, okay? What is big n? A bigger pardon? Big n. Big N is a number of levels. So in the picture here, it's, uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 5, up to, I think it's 10 here. N, N is a number of levels. Okay. So that's a, that's a nice formula. It really tells you something about this process. Now, we follow the advice of uh, Mr. McMahon. And he already did that. Put in a Q. Okay, we have heard nice talks on Q and V, and so uh, let's also put a Q. This is now, it's a trick, because uh, unfortunately with this you cannot really, you don't get through, but there's a little trick now. So I put powers of Q here in a very specific way, from Q minus 1 to Q1 minus N. Or zero, then this this in fact can be it's a it's a famous formula. I don't know, maybe uh, it's uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it's a. I don't want to go into the detail of the formula, but but it's a sum 
of q minus 1 to, to these powers, where the new i's are all these intermediate, uh, they're all these, that's, they are called horizontal strips. You remember I had this big figure with 1 and then 2's and 3's, etc. So if you put the 1, it's let's call it, look at uh, McDonald's book, I mean it's a horizontal strip and the 2 is an horizontal strip, etc. It really refers to all those levels, I mean all those coordinates. So this is, um, this s under minus mu is equal to that thing. And of course that suggests a non-uniform probability. That means in other terms, uh, if I divide 1 term in that sum by this, and I sum that, I, f I find 1, of course, okay? But it's non-uniform, but that helps you in, th in this case. It, it, it helps you, and so indeed, I mean, the, the probability of those red dots on these levels can be expressed as a ratio of these. This is the sum of all those possibilities, and then that thing there, okay? And then we have the non-intersecting uh, path, and there we have a well, famous formula which Mark alluded to, which is uh, called the uh, Kali McGregor formula. In, in the uh, discrete cases, the Gessel Viano formula, uh, which enable you to, to express this probability, this Q probability, <laughs> as a product of determinants. And there we have one is in business, I mean, that means to say well, this may lead then ultimately to a kernel and there's a, there's a very, there's a technique in fact which goes back uh, to uh, Enar and Meta, I mean, Meta did really very, very important work on, on that subject. Uh, uh, so that enables you to actually write down the kernel. And I'm not going to write on the kernel, it's, uh, there are formulas which wouldn't mean anything to you, but um, the, the kernel is um, the following. It's a d plus two-fold integral plus a d plus one-fold integral plus some other stuff which is uh, sort of, you know, factorial and such things. I mean q factorial, I should say, where d is the size of that cut. Now, remember I said to you that I like to take the, the, the limit of that, the asymptotics, when the size of that figure becomes larger and larger, and where the cut, where the size of the cut also gets large. But now I'm stuck, because uh, how am I going to deal with a d plus two-fold integral when d gets very large? You know, that, 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 I'm dead. So, but anyway, you can take that limit, you take the limit when q goes to 1, because that's what I'm really interested in. Um, and so that leads, of course, to a determinant point product. That is to say, the, 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 well, even before you take the limit, the, the, the red dot at location x on level m, and the red dot location y on level n, that can be expressed as a determinant of this kernel in that fashion. I mean, if you want to have uh, three things, if you just have the probability that the red dot are location x on m, it just would be uh, k, q, m, x, x, okay? With two, is just that determinant, etc., etc. I mean, there's a whole uh, machinery there. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't want to tell you what the formulas are, but uh, I like to, then one, one has to work very hard. I mean, that default integral is, that's terrible. So you have to struggle very hard to get it down to something that you can deal with. And uh, fortunately, if you work hard enough, you can reduce the default integral into a r-fold integral, where r is exactly the, the number of particles on those lines within the strip. And of course, they remain finite, okay? So, um, so that, that's the result here. So you take that limit, and after so some work, you find that it's a it's a r plus threefold integral at worst, where r is a number of points on the oblique lines. And here I, I can tell you what you know it's uh, this thing k naught is some something involving ascending factorial here. Uh, these are double integrals, which involve a function, which I will tell you something about later, and a k2 is also, this, this is an integral over x, I mean it's a contour integral about x, x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3, etc. This is an, a big 
a big circle, okay? And those RIs, they are R1, R2, R3, they are rational functions. They are rational functions, I will show it to you in a moment, they encode exactly the geometry of your uh, initial uh, picture, okay? I have to tell you what, I have to tell you something about the RI and what these omega are. The omegas are themselves R fold integrals, okay, involving R3, okay, uh, where gamma L, uh, yeah, I, I will show you in a picture where, where this is, this, this gamma L, I think there's a picture later on. Uh, okay, there are these things, anyway. So, uh, this is a van der Mond determinant. So I think I've explained everything. These are uh, rational functions, R1, R2, R3. This is a van der Mond determinant. That's the same rational function there. I have to tell you something about this gamma L in a moment. <coughs> so, don't look at those formulas. All I wanted to say is that those formulas encode the geometry. And let me just look at one of them, say R1. Uh, it involves an ascending factorial. QR uh, is exactly the polynomial, the monic polynomials whose roots are those red dots here. So that means that those guys here. The QC are exactly is a monic polynomial whose roots are exactly the points in the cut here. Uh, the QL and, uh, we call them, this is the right, this is the left, the QL, uh, the monic po uh, polynomials which, uh, whose roots are exactly those points which are to the left here. Okay. And in fact, then I have Q rho uh, saying, uh, exactly the, the monic polynomial whose roots are the projection of that strip onto that axis here. Okay, so we have those two points here. And then the Q sigma is exactly the next remark. The Q sigma is the projection of the other strip onto this here. Okay, so that means the whole geometry sits on those Qs. Okay. That's, all you, that's all you need to know. I mean, forget about the formulas. Okay, now, uh, but I said to you, we, we ultimately want to go to, to the uh, kernel of the blue dots. Okay, that's what we really want. Now, there's uh, actually Mark alluded to that yesterday. There's something called an adjacency matrix for a diamond model. That means to say that uh, uh, you know, because a a tile can be put. If you have a little a little tr a triangle, a tile can be put in a certain way, like this, like that, like that. So it really connects the, the, the three possibilities each time, and that leads to, uh, in, in fact, the, the so-called honeycomb lattice. And then you have diamonds. I mean, you have connectors, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have an, an adjacency matrix for that. Okay, that's a very sparse matrix. It had lots of zeros, especially you have nearest neighbors. You have something. The inverse of that thing, uh, of course, even though it's a very sparse matrix, the inverse of that matrix is very complicated. Okay? But it turns out that the inverse of that matrix is called the Castellani matrix, because he, he introduced that many years ago in, in, the, in the 30s. I mean, the inverse of that matrix is exactly that K red kernel. Exactly. Okay? I mean, you, you, you check that. In, you check that in a sort of indirect way. And that then combined with, with uh, some other statement by uh, Richard Kenyon enables them to actually write down the, uh, the kernel for the blue dots. So what is the result there is that these are your red dots. This is, this is the red dot. Right? The blue dots, they are actually, they are half half a distance away. And what you show, I mean, in, in, in fact, at the end, it's a lot of work, but in the end, it's very simple. You, s you, you show that the, uh, that the kernel for the blue dots here can be deduced from the red kernel, from the red kernel by uh, just taking n minus 1 by looking, it's the red kernel correspond to that point and that point. 
So it's a very easy null correspondence. So it's, it's essentially the same, but very, very small changes there, okay? So that's really uh, what, well, in, uh, yeah, in coordinate is this. I mean, mm, I mean you can introduce uh, eta C coordinates. The eta is, are, are uh, they parameterize different lines. The C is the running variable along, I mean, it's all, of course, discrete, eh? all uh, integers, they uh, parameterize the different lines here, and then the C, they parameter does the running variable along that line. So now we take the, the, the scaling limit. We take the, the, the scaling limit, and is that that uh, blue kernel within the limit will tend to the discrete technical kernel. And, well, you have to, now, now I come to your question. So the scaling is the following. I mean, you, you remember you had n, n1 was the, the, the length of, of course, you don't remember, but it, it, uh, it completed the geometry. You have n1, n2, and n1, and n2, etc. completed the, the geometry of the problem. The d, the d here is the, uh, is the size of the cut. So you let everything go to infinity, including the size of the cut. But in, in, in a very, very, very precise way, you have uh, not much freedom. I mean, the freedom is that you have a, a parameter kappa here, and uh, that, that's the freedom you have, and you have some parameters, beta 1, beta 2, gamma 1, gamma 2, but most of it will wash out in the end. In fact, at the end, it will only depend on this one parameter beta, which is minus beta 1, minus beta 2. So do this, then you have, in addition, you have to also scale the variables. What we did here to scale the geometry, but then you have to, to scale your variables as well. The, the point here now is that the eta i variables, they parameterize those lines. You keep them discrete. But the running variable along the lines, you make them continuous. Okay. And you make them continuous by multiplying by uh, replacing ci by some variable theta i times the square root of d, the d being the uh, size of the cut, okay? And then there's some origin, which in fact is a point which lies, you have the strip, you have that left line, you have the strip like this, you have the left line, the strip, and you look essentially at the middle point, of the, that would be the origin where to do the asymptotics, okay? And then you, it's a big problem, you have lots of integration, it's a big problem of steepest descent methods, but it all works beautifully in, at, at the end, because you make millions of mistakes. They don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and the kappa. Well, the, the, the kappa probably has to do with some pressure. You can put more or less pressure on the problem. The, the, there's a parameter there, but, that's, uh, but in fact, it, it washes out at the end. So, okay, uh, so you take your blue kernel. There's some, you have to do a little bit of uh, conjugate. You know, if you take a kernel, if you conjugate it, you look at the fraton determinant of it, it's, it doesn't matter if you conjugate it, right? And so you find this technical kernel, and now don't, don't, be, don't be scared when I show it to you. It's this, okay? Now, now you, will, you will say, well, I mean, so what, what, what the hell? I mean, what, you have gotten a formula. It's complicated. Come on. I mean, you know, this is... Uh, but, of course, it's nice to have a kernel. It's one thing, but, but you can do something with it, okay? It's not just uh, something to, to, uh, to admire. I mean, now, okay. We're not admire that. <laughs> we're not admire. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do something with it. And that's what I... In fact, let me say a little bit about these formulas. Uh, of course, you see just this sort of Gaussian type things. There are various, uh, you see, the tau i's, they are the different levels. They are discrete. The tau, the tau is discrete variable. The theta, that's a, that's a continuous variable. That's a running variable on those lines, okay? So, remember those lines, the, the tau, uh, the, 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 the parameter of those lines, the theta is a, ru a running, continuous running variable along those lines. So, you get this. The gamma naught is a little circle about the origin. The L naught plus is, a, uh, is an imaginary axis to the right of that little circle, okay? 
So it's um, that's why I, I put here, and it, it goes from the, from the bottom, it goes up. Um, then I have the, the beta was that parameter which I mentioned earlier, which uh, survives there. And then you have uh, a function theta r. What, is the, what about the row? Uh, then you have those theta r's, and I showed you what, what these theta r's are. So, um, yeah, I mean the, the row is what I mentioned. Before. That's the width of the strip. It's, it's the width of the strip. I mean, I mean the row. So, and then I have those functions here. I mean, they are R fold integrals. Okay, they are fold integral. They, I mean, nothing spectacular. They involve a van, they involve a, a, a van der Mann determinant here. And then you have this heavy side function there. Okay. So that that's what it is. Uh, now I like to say I like to look at that model, this model again. And so uh, the, the Antoine's model that he made. Uh, and I again look at uh, a microscope about that region, about those two cuts. So I have those parallel lines. So I like to know. For instance, what is the distribution? What is the distribution of the red, the, sorry, the blue tiles all along these lines here? Okay, that, that's what I want to know. Okay, I also want to know, say, what's the joint distribution of the blue tiles here along the, the line tau one and tau two? Say, okay, such such questions. And uh, so let me tell you what the result is. <coughs> So the, the probability that x tau is in the x is equal to, I mean, the density is equal to some function which I will call d, okay? Uh, the joint distribution of x tau 1 and y tau 2 along different lines, I have a line tau 1, I have a line tau 2, I look at uh, the, the probability that those particles lie in dx and in dy, I mean, that's equal to uh, that d, that density times the volume of some polytope. Okay, I mean there's a there's a polytope. I don't want to go much into that, but it's, it's the volume of essentially. I mean the interlacing particles, the volume of uh, you know the the object that you get with this interlacing. Now I have to tell you what these these are. Well, the these are the following. Uh, it's given by uh, a Gaussian is given by a van der Mann determinant. If it if there was a square there, it would be G V again. Okay. But it's not a square. It's multiplied instead of a, a square, you have a van der, a regular van der Mann determinant times some other object here, which I will show you in the next slide. Um, so the forms are a little different according to whether you are inside the strip or outside the strip. Okay, it's different. There are different formulas. And uh, so th these are, this is the sort of pseudo van der Mann that you get. I mean, it's uh, for tau bigger than rho, it's the fine formula. It tries to be van der Mann, but it doesn't quite make it. At the end, you have r. Uh, remember, r is the number of particles. You have, you have r uh, functions phi, which are given by those uh, integrals of the imaginary line here, which turns out to be, this turns out to be uh, a tr truncated um, moment or an emit polynomial you know, according to whether k is positive or negative. Okay, uh, so these are these two things. So it means you get very concrete answers. You can compute well, essentially everything uh, from that current. I wouldn't know how to do it otherwise. Okay. But they are, they are simple formulas. So you can explain to someone on the street. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to mention but that will take one minute. I just wanted to mention that there is uh, recent work. The, uh, yeah, there's maybe one one remark I want to make is that distribution comes up in many other situations. The distribution which I wrote, at least for rho equal to r, that means to say, when the width of the strip is equal to the number of particles, we have seen in uh, seen in overlapping aspect diamonds, in couple of matrices. Okay. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, say is that if you even allow more complexity, 
Then you will see the three phases, that is to say the solid, the, the, uh, the liquid and the fast uh, uh, phase. And there has been quite a bit of work on by Gort Johansson and his collaborators. Um, there has been quite a bit of work and I think what's interesting uh, it's a situation where uh, you have some periodicity, as to say, it's uh, you, you put a tile, you put a tile here, from here to here, with with A, with a weight A, and here it's with with uh, weight B, where B is different from A. So it sort of alternates, and that gives much more complexity. It's still the same geometrical figure, and then it leads to the following uh, figure. Now, especially the, the low one. Just look at that. Uh, again, close your eyes. And uh, you, you have a frozen region here, I mean solid region here. You have here a liquid region. And here you have an octet, I mean a, a curve of degree 8, in which you have a gas phase. Okay. Okay. And, it is, of course, very interesting now to, to understand the, uh, the uh, critical statistics about all those singularities here. So that's still, I mean, those. Okay, but uh, I think that, thank you very much. Questions, remarks? Yes. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've seen um, the Aztec diamond boundary and the hexagonal boundary. Yes. Um, and you talked a bit about those two incisions. Yes. I mean, it seems to me that you know, there's, a, there's a whole universe of... Uh, yeah, you can... Um, so, uh, can you um, um, select no, certain no, types no, no. that are... Can you say that the examples you're looking at are representative of all kinds of boundary conditions, or is it just... Well, I mean, the thing is, uh, you, you always have to look at, in a way, the... Uh, I, have the I mean, uh, you, you, you have to look at um, the geometry of the Arctic circle, the, the, that is to say the boundary between the, the solid and the liquid region. And that's where you have all kind of, uh, and when you have critical points appearing, like you know, tag nodes, like uh, these, um, uh, I mean, these other singularities, that's where you will find some new statistics. So what you try to do is to manufacture geometry. However, ma manufacture geometry of those uh, shapes, of the geometric shapes, in such a way that you have such singularities. And this near those singularities that you have this critical statistics, this interesting statistics. I mean, o otherwise you won't find anything, but that's really where, where, they, where they will appear. So that means to say manufacture, uh, the, the, the idea really is to try to manufacture a model which is simple enough that you can do it, <laughs> maybe with tears that you can do it, but uh, in such a way that it displays that the uh, Arctic circle of ellipse or whatever, the Arctic shape displays certain singularities and then you are in business. So the, it seems very much like um, each one of the singularities goes with a certain statistics. So we have a classification according yeah, to I mean, uh, the No, I mean the thing is, I, I think the number of singularities is not very, you know, it, it, it's it's quick, quickly exhausted. I mean, the thing is, and that's why one looked at uh, tiling model because they have. You know, a few years ago, I know we, we all worked on uh, non-intersecting. I mean, the Dyson Brownian motion is a very interesting model, but that has very much less flexibility. That's to say, you take uh, Brownian motions, non-intersecting Brownian motions. I mean, repulsing Brownian motion, leaving at one point, say, and going to an, to another point, ending up at somewhere else. 
and you may have several such things. I mean, then they they can touch, they can merge, etc. You see all kind of things, but you have less less flexibility. Like for instance, this uh, this discrete uh, tech node kernel you don't find in those models. So you have to have sort of more degrees of freedom, and the pay of this is the uh, in the last two minutes that I mentioned that is that's again uh, putting in some some more degrees of freedom, some more flexibility. So I... Well, the trick is you put it in a more so you get something new, but not so much that you can't solve it. Yeah, it's always, it's always you, 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 have, you want to have a, a model which, in, which has a sufficient complexity, but uh, which... Um, <laughs> you can do it. But which you can do, yeah. That's, uh, of course, you can come up with any you know, wild model, but then... Uh, most things are not solvable. You see, it's exact, exact solvability. I mean, you, you may have the same phenomenon in a situation where you can't solve it. But then, unless you have a perturbation theory, right. you won't be able to prove that you have the same phenomena. Right. So that, that's, that's part of the problem. So you're really restricted to things, you, exact solvability situations, like, like, like complete integrability in mechanics. You know, and that's. You know, of course, there's a KM theory, there's a perturbation theory that tells you when you go beyond complete integrability and you perturb, you still get the same phenomena. In, in the system of mechanics, it's a much, that fundamental kind of perturbation theory is much harder to get. So you're really more <laughs> stuck with exactly solving things. I, I, you I think we should start the discussion now because we are. Let's start again. The next speaker is Kenya Castillo, and he will speak about the uh, interleaved properties for zeros of power orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle. Well, Please. thank you, and thank you also for inviting me. Essentially, the main results that I'm going to, to state and prove as possible during the next hour are motivated by an equation that was posted by Paul Turan in 1975 during a series of lectures that he presented at the University of Montreal and that were published in a posthumous paper, a problem paper using a definition of Erdos. Maybe it's too high up, you are. It's okay. No? I don't know if it's too high. Is that better? I don't know. It's okay? It's okay now? Okay. And so, uh, essentially, the, one of those uh, problems posed by Turan is, is this one. Uh, in the first part, Turan commented something that is very well known. If we have a sequence of orthogonal polynomial with respect to a measure whose support is contained on a subset of the real line, good, good measure, uh, no trivial, uh, positive, and so. He, he, he commented that the, 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 the series of two consecutive elements of such a sequence interlace. In fact, they are strictly interlace. And, and he asked what uh, correspond to, to these facts on the unique circle. Of course, uh, the orthogonal polynomials with respect to, to a measure whose support is contained on the unique circle uh, do not answer to run problem things for instance in this sequence of polynomials which is orthogonal with respect to to Lebesgue's measure on the unique series but but uh, probably in some sense uh, uh, the, the solution to the problem is is close to this kind of polynomial things for instance and this sequence of polynomials whose series are the roots of the uni. Using our geometrical intuition, it's, it's easy to see that the series of two consecutive elements of this sequence interlace on, on the unique circle. 
let me explain briefly with with an example what I mean by interlace on the unique circle. We have here as one. Suppose that we have a seat, a seat with four different points on S1, and we have other seat with different between them, other seat with two different points also in S1. Uh, we can say that the elements of these two seats interlace on F1 if, well, this at this point, if we can add to the small seat two other points also in S1 in order to, between two points of any of these seats, there are exactly one point of the other one. For instance, with this distribution and according to our definition, clearly the elements of these two seats interlace interli because we can add two points here, but with this distribution, the elements of these two seats, according to our definition, do not interlace on, on S1. And so you can't have two points of one guy in between two points of another guy. Yes, our definition implies that between two points of the small seat, there are at most one point of the big one. Yes, it's, it's a guy. Yes. And, and well, Probably the solution to Turan problem is close to this kind of polynomials <laughs> because, uh, because imagine that instant this particular case we, we, we extend these ideas in the following sense. Well, using these polynomials, what we have is this is the reciprocal polynomial. What we have here is this polynomial and what we have here is one. And, and a generalization or an, an extension in, in, in which way, where instant this, this particular sequence of orthogonal polynomials on the unique circle, so we can consider a general sequence of orthogonal polynomials on the unique circle. And instant, a number uh, one here, we can consider an arbitrary number on S1. And, and, and so the, the polynomials defined in this more general way are known as par orthogonal polynomial. And in fact, we can, we can provide a solution to Turan problem um, using, using these polynomials, but I prefer to rewrite our problem as an Eichen value problem for certain good companion matrices. And of course, unitary matrices with simple Eichen values on, on S1. And these matrices were introduced by Bonset, Gerten, and Elsner in 1991. Essentially, in in this, well, this will be the companion matrix for the parorthogonal polynomial of degree n plus one, we fix n. And, and essentially, in this n numbers on, on, on the unique disk, we codify the arbitrary polynomial orthogonal with, of degree n, or, uh, orthogonal with respect to a certain measure on the unique circle. And with this number, this number will be the extension of natural, the natural extension of this one, and, and the matrix will be essentially the product of two, two, two diagonal matrices, block diagonal matrices, whose blocks were this block were were defined, were were defined here. Um, of course, according to the definition of the block, this matrix is a unitary matrix. And, and also, we, we can prove that this matrix has, even in, in a simple way, we can prove that this matrix ha, has simple eigenvalues. Are those diagonal blocks? Are those blocks Yes, yes, yes. I'm using, I'm using a, a direct sums, but we can rewrite re this as, as a, standard, a standard product of uh, matrices of order n, n, n plus 1 in this way. And this is useful, useful to, to, to prove that the values of these matrices are symbols. Or, or all these ideas are really well known in linear algebra, because as we've seen, for instance, in the Felder companion matrix, the situation is 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 is, is really similar to, to this one. Well, uh, I'm interested. It's interesting now and to prove that, well, not to prove, only show that the values of the matrix C are also simple. For this. Let me redefine now using this block, these matrices. 
what we have here is the 2x2 two two blocks and this is the identity matrix and I'm going to put here again the identity matrix and in this case what we have is, let me see, is n and is this. Using this we can write this like a standard product of matrix. And what is interesting is that if instant this order we we put this matrix in the in the natural order what we have here and, and this is very well known uh, what we have here is an unreducible Hessenberg matrix uh, and so the they hin values are geometrically simple and so the hin values are in fact algebraically simple and, and because this matrix is unitary equivalent to, do, to the matrix C and so our matrix C is, is a matrix whose uh, an unitary matrix with, with, with simple like, hin values and, and, and now we are in condition to, to define formally what, what we mean by, by parathogonal polynomial for us for orthogonal polynomial as degree n plus one uh, will be any any characteristic polynomial associated with for a matrix similar to to the matrix C, and and from now on I'm I'm going only to speak about interlaced properties of the hin values of the matrix C and not about interlaced properties of the series of. of so the matrix C, so the, I mean, so these are just polynomials. The, the, the measure, the Lebesgue measure is gone. The fact, the, the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially, we codify all this information in in in, in, in these elements, and, and yet uh, this polynomial satisfies a weakened orthogonality conditions. They are not orthogonal with respect to constant, but this is not important now. Um, it's true that many people call this matrix C and V matrix, but I prefer to avoid this denomina denomination because in linear algebra, the results of this paper. Uh, are non sign 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 Watkin papers. Uh, but Watkins is a survey for science review. And when Watkin refers to this kind of matrix, he quote a beautiful PhD thesis of Bonhorst that was defended in 1993 uh, under the supervision of Elsner. He used a different title because he had a preliminary versions because the test was defended also in 1993, the same year in which Watkin papers appeared. And if it's clear after read Watkin results that all that nothing new is in the Cantero Morari Velasquez paper, more clear will be if we read the Bonhorst PhD test, which is a very beautiful, in fact, a very beautiful work. Okay, the solution to Duran problem was solved by Bonhorst and also by, by Simon in 2007. Essentially, what Bonhoeffer proved is that between, well, that the hin values of this matrix and this one, if we think in polynomial, what we have here is the parorthogonal polynomial of degree n plus one, and what we have here is the parorthogonal polynomial of degree n, the hin values of these two matrices interlace, and in fact, they have at most one common hin values with it, which is this one. Uh, regarding to, to Simon Ward, Simon proved these results in, in a very different way, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pretty piece, piece of work. Uh, what, well, using Golinsky, Golinsky wrote for, for Maya Sanet that Simon, we know now that Bonhorst first, uh, give a complete solution for the spectral problem for, fin well, essentially, he studied the interlaced property between the hin values of this matrix and this one. Uh, and the question is how we can extend this using Golinsky word, how we can give a complete solution uh, for the direct spectral problem between this one and any truncation. This is like a principal truncation. It's not exactly a truncation because it's a truncation and a modification, in fact, by a rank one matrix. And we are interested in, 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 the, general, in the general results. In this way, it are, let me first, well, we define two seed. We will come back to this seed. But we define two seed that essentially depend on the original elements of, of the right. And, and, and our first result is this one. Be, 
the hidden values of this matrix and this one, here m is less than n. In the previous cases, m n is equal n minus 1. Well, we can prove that the, the hidden values of this matrix and this one interlace. And in fact, we can identify the possible common agent values between these two matrices that will be this, this set. And even we can say that the elements of this set and this one are strictly interlace. If this is true, I'm going to prove this, but if this is true, we can prove in a very easy way the bone horse. Can I ask you something? Is, is yes. Show that um, you know, given a, so, some, you give, I guess the, the originally you start with a measure on the circle, and then you produce those matrices. So the, the mechanism, and then those matrices, if you take the spectrum of the matrices, and you get the, the zeros of the polynomial. Is that easy to show? What's the mechanism for showing that you go? I mean, I, I, my understanding is you start out with a measure on the circle, you get a final polynomial divide. Right. Forget the measure. What we have now is essentially these two matrices, two unitary matrices with simple eigenvalues, two uh, structured unitary matrices with simple eigenvalues on the unix. No, I understand that, but wasn't the original problem? I'm just trying to track it. The original problem is starting out is to identify a sequence of polynomials whose series interlace on S1. Oh, so that's a, yeah, but, but of course that's connected to, to a measure. In some kind, say yes, so and so and the measure will be the same measure for which this, well, the polynomials Q are orthogonal. In fact, the polynomial P satisfies a weakened orthogonality conditions for the same measure for which the polynomial Q are, in the usual sense, the orthogonal polynomials on the unique circle. Well, I mean, you must have a map which gets you from the polynomials a map between po yes yes even even what I'm going to do here is a map between unitary matrix to Hermitian matrix and, and yes well um, let me see well if this if this result is true I I, I can prove the the in in in, an, in a very easy way the result proved by Bonhorst and by Simons in the following way. What we have in the previous case is m is equal n minus 1. So we need to identify the elements of the seed A. But, but, but in this case, well, to identify the elements of this seed, we need to see the matrix N. But when m is equal n minus 1, what we have here is just this scalar number. N will be just a number. That is, that is this one. That is this one. Well, so if this number is is an eigenvalues of this matrix, then what we have here is that A is exactly this number. Or, in other case, what we have is that A is the empty set. Uh, according to our definition as B, what we have here is that B is the empty set, and what we have here is that B is exactly those numbers. And so, with this, it's sufficient to identify the possible combination values between the, the two matrices when we have in this, this particular case. The interlaced properties is, was proven in general. So, as I previously commented, uh, von Horst proved the case and, and for this case. And, and also was reproved by Simon, but Simon also proved a weakened version of, of the previous results. He proved that between two eigenvalues of the small matrix, there are exactly, there are at most, I'm sorry, there are at most one eigenvalues of the big one. But the hard question is, uh, which are the common eigenvalues between these two matrices? Um, other results related with this, these ideas that I'm going to prove is, is that the eigenvalues of this matrix and the eigenvalues of this one, we modify the elements of the right in this way. In fact, in this case, the eigenvalues of these two matrices strictly interlace. This for m equal zero and beta equal minus one was proved in a very old paper by Geronimus. 
for m equal c was proved by Ahmad, Grad and Reschel, and for m equal n was proved also by Bonhorst. And, and, and all these results were reproved by Simon in 2007, and between the original words and the Simon proof, many people prove it again and again, and, and publish it also in good papers, these, these results. And Essentially, our, our, our results are supported by three, three, three facts. Suppose that we have a matrix, two, two unitary matrices, U and S, and both, of course, of the same order. Suppose also that the, the run of the identity list S is, is equal to one. Uh, uh, so our first conclusion is that the eigenvalues of U and U.S. interlace. But but this is, in fact, this is a, a witnessed version of a very old result proved by Arvens and Gold. But this is the more easy part. Because remember that meta theorem that, that, that say that for any, any theorem on a structured run one perturbation of self adjoint matrices, there is, there is a corresponding result for, for unitary matrices. And in fact, uh, all that we need to do here is, is using the Kali transform, we write this problem as, an, uh, as a run, Hermitian run one perturbation of an Hermitian matrices, and we come back to the Gamacher and Crane book, and we know that the eigenvalues of the original Hermitian matrix and the perturber Hermitian matrix interlace. So we, we come back to, the, to, to S1 and, and we have these this results that is related with the Wignet version presented by Simon that I previously commented. But, but we are interested in, 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 in to prove, under some additional conditions, the, the possible combination values between these two matrices. And, and for this, assume that the matrix US admits these this compositions. And the order of this matrix will be equal to the order of this one, and so the order of this one will be equal to, to the order of this one. Assume also that U1 has simple eigenvalues and U2 has simple eigenvalues and assume that uh, these two matrices have not common eigenvalues and the same happened with this one and this one. With this U I'm denoting the set of eigenvalues of the matrix U1 and, 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 and for the rest it's the same. And under this condition, we can prove that the elements of these two sets interlace. What we know about the fir first part is that the elements of U and U1 interlace. If this set represents the, the, the common eigenvalues between U and U1, then clearly the elements of this set and the elements of this one strictly interlace. But even we can add some points yeah, and, 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 and we have, in, in this case, that the eigenvalues of these two sets are strictly interlaced. In, in any case, I, I can prove this, but I need a more a space. Let me... My talk was original planet for 30 minutes, but w with one hour I have time to do this. And yes, two times. Thank you. So essentially, all that we need. Uh, probably. Essentially, all that that we need to prove. All that we need to prove is this. We claim that the the the, the, the set of common eigenvalues between U and U1 will be the same that the common eigenvalues between U and U2. And what is more interesting will be exactly the common eigenvalues between U1 and U2. All that we need is this. Not that this part is, is, this part is trivial. 
because follows directly from the interlaced property in the following sense. We know that the eigenvalues of this matrix interlace with the eigenvalues of the, these two matrices. So, suppose that with x, x are the eigenvalues of u. And suppose that we have this distribution, one point here and here, two points. What are the dots? The, the, oh, the dots are the eigenvalues of u and u1 distinctly. We have the same number of points, no? Suppose that we had a, a common eigenvalue between this one and this one. Something like this. But we know that the eigenvalues of these two matrices interlace with the eigenvalues of this one. Then this situation is impossible. This point need to move to this position or to this one. So this part is, is clear. And and how we can prove the rest? Well, the, the run of the identity less s is equal to 1. So, what we have is this. There exists two non-zero vectors in order, in order to have this. So, using the, 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 the formula for the run one per, uh, for the determinant of a run one perturbation of, of a matrix, normal matrix in general, what we have is, is this. This is the characteristic polynomial of u. Plus u. So, but these matrices are unitary matrices. Let me, and, and, and this will be the, the spectral discomposition for, for the matrix US, where, where C uh, is this matrix. Um, well, these are vectors. And what I have here is I'm, uh, now the matrix is a matrix of order n. What I have here is this. We can prove that for this case, the we can prove for this case this one. But if we put here, we fix J, and so we can prove that the adjugate of this matrix is exactly the derivative of the characteristic polynomial of this matrix at this point, and we put here this this I'm sorry probably in the in the other sense because yes because we have a matrix not not on a scalar so if we put this here at this point well this quantity is zero and what we have is Remember that that this matrix admits a decomposition like as a direct sum between u1 and u2. So what we have here is Is this not that this part according to this is also trivial because this, we have an eigenvalues of u1 and u2 then this is zero this is zero all this is zero and then will be also an eigenvalues of this one but the problem is suppose that we have this this is u1 and what we have here is u2 if we have an eigenvalue here as we see, uh, the, 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 if we have an eigenvalue here, a common eigenvalue between u1 and u2, then this number will be also an eigenvalue of u. But what happens if, if, if we are in, in this red part or in this green part? Well, we need, well, 
so, something curious happens because if we are in the in the in the red part or in the green part, I'm going to prove that this quantity will be different from zero. Assume for now that if if we have an eigen value here or here, this quantity will be different from zero. If this is true, suppose that with all laws of generality that we have an eigen value here. So this quantity will be zero, and this one will be different from zero because we are in the green part, and this one will be different from zero because we assume that the eigenvalues of u1 are simples, and what, what we have is that this quantity will be different from zero. And, and, and with this, what we have is exactly our claim. All that we need to prove is that if we have an eigenvalue here or here, this quantity will be different from zero. Oh. And, and how, how, how we can prove this? Well, what we have is this. So this matrix admits this, this composition. And, 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 and this will be the eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalues lambda j. Sign, we are, l let me assume that we are, well, no. Let me put this. What I'm going to prove is if we have an eigenvalue in, you, in, in the green part, in the, in the red part, or in the green part, then this quantity will be different from zero. I'm not going to prove this. I'm going to prove just that if we have an eigenvalue in, in, the, in the red part here, then this is number. This is a number. What we have is that this, well, no, sorry. What we have is that this quantity will be different from zero. In the same way, we can prove that if we have an eigenvalue here, also this part will be different from zero. And in the same way, we can prove that if we have an eigenvalue here, this will be different from zero, and also this will be different from zero. But I'm going only prove this this case. Well, uh, if we have an eigenvalue in, in, in this part, what we have is this. This will be the eigenvectors associated with this eigenvalue. Sign, sign. We are in this, in the green part, in the, no, in the red part. This is a set of vectors, and this is this will be the eigenvectors associated with the with the eigenvalue lambda j of of u one. And what we have here is. This is essentially US, U, and this. But suppose that this quantity is equal to zero. I'm going to prove this. Suppose that this quantity is equal to zero. If this quantity is equal to zero, this will be zero. So this implies that this implies that well this implies this, but this is the eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalues lambda j for this matrix. What we have here is is this. So in other words, what we have is that u1 the intersection of this two set is non-empty, which is a contradiction according to, to our hypothesis. I'm sorry, the hypotheses are, are here. So, with this, we prove this step. If we have here or here, this quantity will be different from zero. And with all this, we have this. And with this, we, we, we have our 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 results 
Um, if instant uh, this situation we have other one for, for the other one oh. I'm not going to use the board again. <laughs> well, other, other results that we need to prove our, our, our theorems is, is this one. Suppose that we have now a unitary matrices and let go to assume with the laws of generality that k is equal to 1. And, and OK, both matrices of the same order and, and assume that I'm going to assume that k is equal to 1. S will be the identity matrix except for the first, uh, for the entry at the position 1, 1 that we put in this play. This one. Well, S will be for us this one. This matrix. This is Vira, and the rest is, is the identity matrix. This is a number. On S1, different from 1. And, and assume that the eigenvalues of U has, assume that U has simple eigenvalues, and assume that the eigenvectors of U have uh, an OS0 element at the first position. So we, we can conclude that the elements of the, the eigenvalues of U and US uh, strictly interlace on, on, on S1. Essentially, because we can use the, the previous ideas and, and well, instant, well, with this and denoting now the, the, the spectral descomposition of U, not the spectral descomposition of US. And if we repeat our ideas, what we have is that, what we have is this. The, the interlaced properties is clear by the first sentence of the previous theorem, but to but we need to prove that 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 U and US have not common eigenvalues, and and to do this we make this. But in this case, this part is 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 have is very is very easy because well because this will be essentially this. Sign this is our matrix, what we have is this. This is the the first the, the elements of the first position of the first entry of this angle vector. So this quantity is, is clearly different from, from zero and, and, and with this we have this. Of course, if for this matrix we have Instant u, we, we put our matrix C. What we have is that the eigenvalues of this this matrix C and and, and, and this one after a modification in this way uh, strictly interlaced because all the entries of the eigenvectors associated with the matrix U are non-zero because essentially are orthogonal polynomials on the unique circles whose zeros are clearly. On the, on the unique disk are orthogonal polynomials on the unique circle evaluated at a point on S1. So they are different from C. And now we only need to prove this. And with this, 
and with this we are in condition to, to, to prove with all calculations uh, our results. Uh, suppose that we have our matrix C partitioned in, in this way. Uh, we can prove that this matrix has not eigenvalues on, on S1. Let me well not well not not but if 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 we have an eigenvalue of C to two in S in, in S one then this number will be also an eigenvalue of C. We need this. But this is trivial because suppose that we have an eigenvalues here. What we have is this. Um, and so what we have is this. Suppose that our eigenvector is, is normalized and defined this, whose dimension is the dimension of the matrix C. Um, so, uh, what we have is clearly that this is true, and sign our matrix is a unitary matrix, what, what we have is that this is also true. So, let me put a square here and a square here, and so this implies that, remember, the, the, we have this, this partition, and we have this part with zero. What we have here is, I'm not going to put the dimension, but it's the Euclidean norm, the corresponding dimension. And what we have here is, uh, yes. But this part is, is equal to one. So this is zero, which implies that this is also zero, and what we have is that, what we have is this. That this number will be an eigenvalues of Z, in fact, associated with an eigenvector in this way. Well, assume this. H how we can prove this? Well, notice that if we could to this matrix here, what we have are, what, what we have are, what we have, we have, uh, three elements here and two elements here. If we could here, we have uh, two elements here and three elements here. And so I assume that M is even. Um, and with this, we finish practically. Assume that that M is even and define this matrix this matrix is this one am rm am plus 1 rm 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 plus 1 the rest of the elements are zero and the same happened here and what we have exactly here is the matrix c to 2 Define a matrix C, a matrix X in this way. What happened with the eigenvalues of these two matrices? Well, we know that the eigenvalues of these two matrices are strictly interlaced. So, assume that this matrix, the, assume that this one has an eigenvalue on S1. If this one has an eigenvalue of in, in, on S1, we know that this one, this number will be also an eigenvalues of this one. But this one is just this one, and we multiply these two quantity here. So, under our assumption, we have a contradiction because this number will be a common eigenvalues of these two matrices. But this is impossible. So with this, we prove this, this last result, and now all that we need to do is to check that the hypothesis of the previous results are useful to prove this. We introduce a matrix S in this way. It's, it's easy to prove that S will be a matrix whose the rank of the identity less S will be 1. And, and assume that M is odd. What we have is this. This matrix 
uh, has eigenvalues on S1, this one has eigenvalues on S1, so if this one is partitioned as, as we showed previously, this one and C1, C1 uh, have not common eigenvalues, the same uh, happens with this one and C2, so it's very easy to see that the common eigenvalues between this one and this one are those that are common between this one and this one. And, uh, and there are many calculations, but I think that the mathematics is a question of idea and uh, of calculation. And, and for the second results, we introduce a matrix S in this way, and what we have is this equality when, when M is even, is different. And, and clearly, according to one of our results, we know that the eigenvalues of this matrix strictly interlace with the eigenvalues of this one, and clearly, then the eigenvalues of this one strictly interlay with, with the eigenvalues of, of this one. And, 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 well, these kind of results are, are even when we have a self adjoint matrices, if, if we have a, a self adjoint matrix in this way, if, if instant, this, if we have a self adjoint matrix partitioned in this way, we know that we have a certain relation by a Cauchy interlacing theorem between the eigenvalues of this one and this one. But in general, we cannot say it that between two eigenvalues of this one, there are at last one eigenvalues of this one. To do this, we need to put condition here, and if the rank of C is equal to one, then we can say that between two eigenvalues of this one, we have one eigenvalues of this one. A, a particular case is when, when we have the diagonal matrix, think in, ah, think in an unreducible symmetric diagonal matrix. Uh, all, all our results apply to normal matrices, not the part related with the interlaced property, those related with, the, with how, how, how we can identify the possible common eigenvalues. And, 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 and if we have this matrix in here, and, and we have this element here, it, it, it's not trivial to identify the, the common eigenvalues between this one and this one. Think in a three-diagonal matrix. We can say that between two eigenvalues of this one, there are exactly one eigenvalues of this. But if you apply this, we can say something related to this. We can identify not the common eigenvalues of this one with this one, but yes, the common eigenvalues of this one if we put here minus this number. Because this problem is related with the rand one perturbation of this one. We put here, what we have here is one, 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 one. But the, the, the original problem, identify the possible common without modification of this one and this one is related with the RAN2 perturbation. So the, the, the situation is, is really, it, it's really different. And, and, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. If the Berbrunsky parameters are real, okay, then uh, a result by uh, Derebiagin, Binet, and Zdanov proved that you have orthogonal polynomials on the real line in the interval negative 1, 1. Then my question is the following. Do you have some interlacing properties with the, your flavor in the real line? That means to have a relation between the zeros of the nth orthogonal polynomials and the zeros of m orthogonal polynomials? This was a result that was proved in, in the integral transforms. I know these results. And yes, you can use the same procedure. This is valid for, for general ortho, orthogonal polynomials. Even when the parameters are real, this is very well known. If you go to the Van Load and Gold book on matrix analysis, you will find this matrix when the parameters are real. In fact, all these results about the decomposition sign the third edition that was published in 1996. I think that we need to... All these problems are all problems in linear algebra. We need to think 
probably because the book of Lux was my first book in, in linear algebra. But uh, yeah, yes, it was in 2002, I think, in 2007, the second edition. Uh, I would like to think in this problem like problem of linear algebra. And, and this is very well known. I know the results of Binet. They've done it, I think. Other questions? Well, this technology that you've used is based on rank one perturbations, essentially, right? Yeah, here is rank one perturbation. But, 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 and but, so when you have a rank two, can you and, say... Uh, yes, you, can, you will have a composition of this perturbation. But it's... And, and, and in fact, I have wait in order to identify, identify when C is rank one, the possible combination values between this one and this one, but are ugly condition. I, I, I would like to think in this better because are, are really ugly conditions. Uh, the, so rank two is ugly? Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a different. It's a different ball game. Yeah, 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 totally different. Okay, further questions? So if not, let's thank the speaker and we have coffee break.